Amen. Well, good morning. It's a blessing for me to be able to share God's Word with you today. And what a privilege it is to minister alongside Phil as one of your staff pastors and to labor among you all with the elders and the deacons of our church. It is a true joy. I don't know if you know this, but Corey Freeman is kind of uh, overseeing and, and running a podcast for our church. It's just called the GCBC Podcast. And it's a podcast of us talking about life and ministry of our church. And so you can look that up. It's just the GCBC podcast. But recently I got to share my testimony in one of those episodes. And I, and I was ending with my love for you all. Uh, I truly count it a joy and a blessing to be one of your pastors. And it is a delight to see you growing in the knowledge and grace of God. And so not only should you check that out, because I think you'll be really encouraged there. In fact, the recent episode that's going to launch this week is an interview with Sean Downey, one of our deacons. And so we're interviewing elders and deacons and talking about ministries of our church. And so that'll be encouraging for you to get to know our deacons and our elders there. But, but I just wanted to remind you of our love for you as a church. As I was teaching the membership class this morning, our job as elders is really a joyful one. It is to look after the souls of God's people and yet, it is a weighty one as well. And so pray for us, and we pray for you. In fact, we'll be gathering as elders this Tuesday to pray for the membership of our church. And so we will be in prayer for you, and we are regularly. So pray for us as we pray for you, and know that we care for you deeply. Well, what is a saint? What is a saint? We'll be in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 to 16 this morning and the question that I want you to think about right now is, what is a saint? Well, I'm going to give you a definition of a saint and see if you can find the heresy in here, okay? This is called Spot That Heresy. It's a, it's a new game. Uh, it's a person who is now in heaven who, while on earth, practiced heroic virtue and lived in fidelity to God's grace. Heroic virtue and fidelity to God's grace. Now, does that sound right? No, we should all be saying no. Uh, that doesn't sound right. Well, that's the definition according to Roman Catholicism. But according to that definition, could I call you a saint? Could you call me a saint? Uh, no, the answer is no. According to that definition from the Roman Catholic Church, the answer is, yeah, probably not, right? How many of you have been heroic in your virtue or have had complete fidelity to God's grace? The, the point isn't to bash the Roman Catholic Church. It is to warn you against the false teaching and the heresy of the Roman Catholic Church and to love and to care for and to preach the gospel to those in your family and life who are trapped in the Roman Catholic Church. But it's to remind you of what the biblical definition of a saint is. The Roman Catholic Church only recognizes just over 10,000 saints. Now that might sound like a lot to you if you're not sure what a saint is, if you've never heard that from the Bible before. And many of those names have been lost in history. And so you could look up a list of the saints that the Roman Catholic Church recognizes, and that would be a, a pretty long list to read through and pretty boring as well. Uh, although they, they're, most of them are known for being able to do certain things. If you lose your keys, you can call on Saint Anthony, maybe. Uh, but there's 10,000, that's all. And so who are you? Right? Who, are, who are you to think that you could be called a saint? Or who am I? That we could ever dream of taking on that title for ourselves. A saint. The Gold Country Baptist Church Saints. A great name for a sports team. Maybe the softball team this year, Dave. But one of the most shocking and unbelievable, unexpected, inconceivable, and almost absurd biblical names for a believer, for a follower of Christ, is just that. Hagias, or saint, or a holy one. And it's all over the New Testament, and the Old Testament for that matter. Holy ones, holy people, who are hardly heroic who are only sinful apart from Christ, who are the least likely in the world and never in a million years would we be able to call ourselves saints in our own effort. 
And yet here we have it in the book of 1 Peter and in the book of 1 Corinthians, a letter written to probably the worst church in the whole New Testament. Just skim over it and you'll see sexual morality, infighting, envy, rivalries, horrible church discipline situations, First and Second Corinthians combined. And yet, the Apostle Paul calls these believers in the opening verses of First Corinthians saints. He calls them holy ones. Even that church are called saints and the people of God, just like Israel was the people of God, called a holy nation. So Peter, in chapter 2, will call, just like we've heard in Exodus recently, the people of God, the church, the, a holy nation. Holy people. And it points to something which is the most, probably the most fundamental question of all religion, which is how in the world can an unholy sinner stand in the presence of an infinitely holy God? That is maybe the most fundamental and important question of all religion. How is it possible that sinners could have any hope of standing in the presence of an infinitely holy God? And here's the bottom line. From a human perspective, it's impossible. It's impossible. Though all other world religions would like you to think that it is possible on your own merit, it is utterly impossible. And many think that God just wants us to simply give it, give it our best shot, to be as good as we could be. But that's not a biblical concept in the Christian life. Try this, absolute perfection. That's the standard. Jesus said, you must be perfect even as your Father who is in heaven is perfect in Matthew 5, 48. No, God doesn't grade on a curve. He can't pretend that his standard isn't perfection. No, friend, he calls you to his standard of perfection and holiness. But here's the thing. It's not just giving it our best shot. That's not a biblical concept it might lead us to think, well, is there any way that we could possibly be saved? Is there any way? And maybe you're thinking that today. Maybe you're not a Christian. Maybe you're new to this whole religion thing. And you're looking for the answer to the question, how can I possibly kind of get my life in order well enough so that God will, will accept me? But maybe now you're thinking, well, sounds like there's no way. There's no way. Is that what you're telling me? Is that what you're saying the Bible says? Is that what Jesus really came to preach? And the answer is yes. On your own, you cannot be saved. That's true. But there is a way. There is the truth and the life. And He, unlike you, is a perfect man. He's the man God. He is fully man and fully God and his name is Jesus Christ and he came to make a way for sinners like you and me who would love in, in our own effort to try and climb the mountain of God and to say, look at me, God. Look how great I've been. Look how well I loved my family and took care of my neighbor, served my country. I, I volunteered in the community. Look how good I've been. Jesus is the only way. What's impossible for man is possible with God through Jesus Christ. And so while we're called to perfect holiness, we have fallen short of this glory of God. I don't know about you, but as we've walked through Exodus, there's that reminder that here is this unholy, unrighteous people who as we walk through the Ten Commandments, fail time and time and time again. And at the time that the commandments were given, they weren't perfect, were they? They were unholy. They had already proven their wickedness. We've all fallen short. And the wages of sin is death. And because God is holy, He must punish sin. And it can't stand before God for a single second. 
which is the great mystery of The incarnation, isn't it? God taking on human flesh to dwell among sinful men. It's a miracle. It's unbelievable. And so this God who is rich in mercy, He sent His Son into the world not just to live a good life, brothers and sisters. Not just to live a morally upright life, but to be a substitute. To stand in the place of the full force of God's hot, red hot fury against our sin. And at that cross to bear the full punishment that we deserved. And all of our filthiness and sin and unholiness was placed on Christ. And he was nailed to a cross. And as we just sang that the record of our debt was canceled against God. He canceled the debt that stood against us, that we could have never paid against God. And praise God for His holiness. Praise God. And in return, the perfect record of Jesus' obedience, His double obedience, uh, to, the, to pay for our sin completely as a sacrifice in our place, and he obeyed the perfect law of God in our place. All of those commandments that we're walk through, walking through in Exodus, Jesus fulfilled every one and the several hundred after that that the Israelites could never fulfill on their own. He obeyed the law perfectly on our behalf, and it was his righteousness was credited to our empty bank account. So by faith, we are united with Him. So united with Him that when God looks upon us, He sees the righteousness and the holy record of His own Son, Jesus. And that bank account that was at zero, eh, nothing, is now filled up with the riches of the righteousness of Christ. Can you believe it? I mean, did you ever go to the, to the ATM machine when you were a kid and put your debit card in and it said insufficient funds? You're like, wait, what? I'm sure I have some money in there. It turns out you spent all of your money in a week on clothes and, you know, uh, 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 theme parks and video games. I mean, I did that. Empty. How? And, and, the, and the pit that that put in your stomach, go, man, I got to tell my parents I don't have any more money. But then you go back and the account is filled up with millions of dollars. It's all yours. This is the righteousness of Christ in your place. I know it's a silly picture, but it is glorious in spiritual terms. But why does that matter? Why does it matter in in terms of this thinking about being a saint? It's because God is concerned for holiness. What it means to be a saint is to be a holy one. God is concerned for and commands you to holiness. Not only a perfect standard, but a life of holiness. But here's the thing, beloved. In view of what God has done through Christ, what God commands, which seems impossible, is made possible. What God commands, that is your holiness, He, through the sufficient glorious work of Christ at the cross, His death and resurrection and His intercession for you now and His Spirit at work in you, He provides all of the means to fulfill His commandments. Do you believe that? When you think about your sin, the sins that you struggle with, the sins that weigh you down, that make you weary, do you believe that God has provided all of the means to combat and fight and have victory over those sins in your life? And I'm not talking about Christian perfectionism perfectionism here. I'm talking about sanctification. I'm talking about progressive sanctification that the scripture talks about, that day by day we are growing more and more into the likeness and image of Christ by God's grace. So that's the connection. What we need is a righteous standing, a perfect, holy, righteous standing before God so that when he looks at us, he sees a perfect person, And who is that perfect person that he sees but Christ standing before you? Wonderful. And so when we come to a text like 1 Peter 1, verses 14 to 16, and we are calling, being called to holiness, 
What we must remember is that what we need more than anything, more than grit, more than a commitment to just say, all right, I'm I'm just not going to sin like that anymore. I'm not going to do it. Though we should say that by God's grace, is we need Christ. We need Christ. We need to say, Lord Jesus, when I look at this command, when I look at this command, my first instinct is to say, God, I can't do this. How could, I, how could I possibly obey what Peter is calling me to here? What you should say is, Lord, I need, I need Christ. And you have provided him. You have given me the very resource that I need most, which is Christ dwelling in me through faith by his spirit. And so, Lord, would you help me? Would you help me to obey this command? Would you help me to be holy? We entitled this message, Holy Father, Holy Children, because what's glorious about this passage is that the very thing that God calls us to be, He makes us to be through His Son, Jesus. Because God is holy and He cannot stand in the presence of sin, He must have a holy people. And He is making us holy, brothers and sisters. He is And so this morning, we're going to explore how we are made holy, what it means to be holy, to be sanctified, and what is the prospect of our holiness, that is, our glorification. And so, just briefly, let me pray. Father, fill us with hope in Yourself and in Your Son and in Your promises here. Would You grant us fresh desire to seek the holiness that means our true happiness in you for your glory. Amen. Well, in verse 13, we saw how Peter explained, begun to explain holiness initially. How is it that we live as we really are in Christ? How is it that we live out the life of a saint? Because brothers and sisters, it doesn't matter if you're 13 and you're trusting in Christ and you have been transformed by the gospel or you're 83, you're a saint. And so how is it that we are to live as those saints, as impossible as it may sound? And the first thing that Peter instructed us in is that before you can be sanctified, before you might be holy, you must have hope. Look at verse 13 of chapter 1. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. First question I have for you is, do you have hope? Do you have hope? And I don't just mean wishful thinking that your life will somehow just kind of get better one day or that your problems will go away, but that regardless of whether your problems ever go away, whether the disease that you're fighting will ever be cured, regardless of whether your marriage will be what you hoped it would be, whether your children who've walked away from the Lord will come to Christ, that your hope is in Christ because you have been bought by the precious blood of Jesus and your greatest treasure and your greatest desire is to be with Him and to see Him one day. Do you have that hope, beloved? And not only that, but have you been hoping fully? Now, I realize that word fully, that kind of stands out to me. How do you hope fully? How do you set your hope fully and completely on the grace of God that is going to be revealed to you when Jesus comes again at his second coming? And what Peter says is in verse 13 is you've got to prepare your minds daily for action. You've got to prepare yourself to hope fully today. Because there will be trials and there will be sin and there will be struggles that will come your way that Satan would love to to use to draw your attention and your hope away from Christ. And so you've got to gird up your mind. So how's that been since we last explored 1 Peter and since we thought about not taking the Lord's name in vain in this last week? Not living as, as hypocrites saying, yes, I, I claim the name of Jesus, but We've been living in sin. How how has it been hoping fully in the Lord lately? And then at a fundamental level, do you have the hope that Christ came to give, that your sins are forgiven? Have you bowed the knee to King Jesus? Have you come to Christ and said, yes, I need living water. Make me live. Are you alive? Do you have this hope? Do you have this living hope that Peter speaks of? 
And so that's the first thing. First things first. Before you might be holy and grow in holiness as a saint, you must have hope. And then verses 14 to 16, Peter helps us. I kind of think of this phrase, the unholy holy, right? We are the holy ones, and yet we see unholiness in our lives all the time. Impatience and anger, lust, envy, pride, all of that. But here we are, Peter calling us saints, holy children. And Peter helps us, these, uh, us as unholy, holy ones, to get a grasp of this great gospel promise. That, that those who have full hope, which comes first, will see God's holiness shape their lives in the ways that we'll look at this morning. And so here's, what, here's kind of how we're going to look. Here's kind of a main point, a proposition. Those who have full hope and see God's holiness shape their lives are first those in our text who have a new name. If you have the hope of the gospel, the transforming power of Christ, and you you will see God's holiness shape your life as one who has a new name. Look at verse 14. In light of what he's just said, that we have hope, full and, and rich hope, because of the grace that will be brought to us, because we will see Christ one day and we will be with him forever. He says this, verse 14, as obedient children, let's just read this text, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, so also you also be holy in all of your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. First, Those who see God's holiness shape their lives in light of their hope are those who firstly have a new name. Look at what he says. He says, we are, in verse 14, children of obedience. We have a new name and we have a new family. You're children of obedience. Think of obedience as your mother, right? You're a child of obedience, right? My children are children of Laura. This is is saying people who are saints, God's people, they have been born Uh, not only out of, but for obedience. And later, Peter will say, you have been born again by obedience to the truth. And then the result of this obedience is ongoing obedience. He says, you are children, obedient children. You could literally translate it, children of obedience. So do you like your name? Do you you like that, that description of yourself? I'm a child of obedience. I am a child who obeys my father. Do you love your family? Are you happy, as as we just sang, to be a part of that family of obedient children? And we're not those who button up our shirts every Sunday and put on our tag, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm obedient, I'm a perfectly obedient child. No, we say we are children who love to obey our father. We're not perfect But when we think about God's commands, we say, yes, Lord, I want to do what you say. Often names mean something. and It's part of how they identify you. And names aren't always significant. The word Corey, it means dweller by a hole. Does that sound important? You know, uh, there's things like a rock quarry and there might be a pond or something. You're waiting for something. I don't even really quite know what it all means, but, you know, I like my name just fine. But I'm not like my name. It means everything to me. But when I read this, I say, yes, I, I belong to this family. I want to be known as a child of obedience. And this is basically what, what Peter means, uh, sorry, what John means. Excuse me. I'm mixing up my first John and first Peter references. What Peter means in verse 3, look at what he says. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be what? Born again. Born into what? Well, born into obedience. Born into a family with a name. And it means something. He's caused us to be born again. This is regeneration. This is conversion to a living hope. And so every believer, right, every Christian human being has two births, a human birth and then a spiritual birth. 
And the second one makes you from a child of the devil. How about that for a name? (laughs) Children of the devil, which is exactly what Jesus said to the Pharisees, to a child of God. So do you like that description of yourself? Are you happy to take that name and say, yes, Lord, I am your child, and I'm a child of obedience. How would you like a classmate or a coworker, a coworker to label you as that? That's not very popular. He, her, she, her, they, them. Those are really popular labels right now. I went back to Spokane, my sweet little Spokane that I grew up in, and I saw a name badge that said they, them, and I'm not mocking I'm just saying, our world is confused. But I wonder if you're confused. Are you happy to take that name upon you? Or have you experienced a crisis, identity crisis, that that you think you're something that you're not? You think you're a Christian, but when you see this description, you say, obedient children, yeah, I I don't want to be obedient to all of God's commands. I want to live my life. You're just as confused as someone in the world who's confused about their pronouns. You see what I'm saying? Peter says, you're a child of obedience. Take that name. Claim that name. Own that name. Or you have to come to grips with the fact that you are still a child of the devil. The obedience of Christ was in part to bring about a Christ-like family of obedience. But this obedience is not boring. It is not morose, boring life. No, these commands, the the commands that God gives are for our good. They set us free. They liberate us from sin to live happy lives in the Lord who made us, who knows what The deepest longings of our soul are in what will truly satisfy us. And so take that phrase, children of obedience, and think on that. Are you happy to have that name, church? The Christian is a son or a daughter of obedience. Here's another way to put it. 1 John chapter 5, John says that, Uh, That we love God and His commandments are not what? Burdensome. They're not a burden to us. I know that there are some in this room that God's commandments are a burden to. When you read the Bible, you're just kind of sick of it. It just disgusts you. Because it it means, it, it makes you think that God is somehow keeping happy things or good things from you. It's because you have bought the lie that your sin promises, that it will satisfy you, that that a little bit of the world is fine, it's okay, but it's actually a, a poison that is slowly killing you and robbing you of your joy in Christ. I know what that's like. I've lived some of my days as a Christian like that, and I have to fight against that every day just like you. So church, Take up this description, your new name, and say, Lord, would you make me happy to be a child of obedience? We're glad to be his children. Are you glad to be his child? Is there a joy in being Jesus' follower? Are you, a, are you happy to be counted among his saints? Are you? You have a new name, so take it up. And as we think about bearing God's name, not in vain, it's a similar idea here. We say, I'm a a child of obedience. Lord, make me to love your commands. Help me to not stray from them. I love the verses that we read in Psalm 119. The Lord is my portion. I promise to keep your words. That's, That's what a child of obedience says. I promise to keep your words. Be gracious to me according to your promise. When I think on my ways, I turn my feet to your testimonies. Kids, you know when your parents are calling you to be obedient, right? You need to listen and obey. What they're telling you to do is turn your feet from disobedience and and walk in the way that they're telling you to. Saints, this is what we must do. Lord, help me to turn my feet to your testimonies. 
I hasten and do not delay to keep your commandments, though the cords of the wicked ensnare me. I do not forget your law. Brothers and sisters, turn away from sin today. Set your feet in the way of God's commandments. Those who have full hope and are holy are those who secondly are those who have a new way of life. Look at chapter 14, the second part of it. He says, as obedient children or children of obedience, what do we do now? What does this life of holiness look like? He says this, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. You have a new way of life. Peter says that we are no longer to be conformed. Just like in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but what be transformed, right, by the renewing of your mind. Don't be conformed to your former passions of ignorance, but as he who called us or called you as holy, be holy. As he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Verse 16, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So you have a new way of life, church. And every Christian faces a slew of, of changes in their life when they are saved. Every believer. And we're going to hear this in Wendy Snow's baptism in a little bit here. That when she trusted in Christ, God changed her. And that's true of you too. If you are in Christ, you're a child of obedience, something has changed. Your life was radically changed. And sometimes it's, it's, it's drastic and there's five things that you knew needed to stop. You needed to stop smoking. You needed to stop doing drugs. You needed to stop hanging out with those friends. You needed to stop going to the bars and you needed to be faithful to your wife or whatever it was. Sometimes, like me, you're born into a Christian home You've got parents who love Christ. You've got a church who knows Jesus and they preach the gospel to you day in and day out from the time, the day you were born to the day that God graciously draws you to himself. That's my life. But God has changed me. I'm not the man that I was when I was 18 or when I was 25 or when I was 13 when God saved me, when he called me. We all experience changes in our life, but to be sure, we live and we see the world, all of us, differently. Our eyes have been opened to what Peter says here, our uh, passion, the passions of our former ignorance, and Paul calls them deceitful desires in Ephesians 4, 22. And the change is this, that they don't deceive us anymore is what Peter is saying here. He's saying, if you're a child of obedience, if you have this hope that you're going to See Jesus when he comes again one day. Don't be conformed any longer to your former passions, your former lusts. That's the word there. But what were these passions? What were they? What were they? They were of ignorance. You were unaware of God's holiness, the seriousness of sin, the righteousness of God, the eternality of hell. And the weight of glory for those who trust in Christ that is coming. You are unaware that there is a prince of the power of the air who is deceiving and blinding the eyes of sinners. You are unaware that you are a child of wrath and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked. You were unaware of those things. But now Peter is saying, you're different you got a new way of life. Don't be conformed any longer to those passions, those passions of your former ignorance. You're not deceived anymore. Your, your th- vision is clear. The veil has been lifted. The sin that you were trapped in and the sin that those ancient believers were trapped in were an illusion. They don't actually make you happy, fulfill you, complete you. They were distraction, much like much of the things going on in our world today. Distraction, to keep your eyes off of Christ, to keep your hope distracted, and my hope. They promised to fulfill your fantasies. They promised happiness and riches, comfort, approval, perfect body image, a perfect home, 
Like a child who takes a, a penny instead of a dime because it's bigger. I can trick my kids with that all day. It's because they're ignorant, right? You're no longer ignorant. You know that the things in your flesh that you longed for only lead to death. And here's another way to describe the change. You're wearied by sin. Are you wearied by sin? Are you just sick of your sin? Because you do sin, right? Being a saint, having a new way of life doesn't mean that you don't sin anymore, but it means you're weary of it. You say, how long, O Lord? How long must I struggle to be patient with my children as they run through the grocery aisles of my soul and knock over all of the idols off of the shelf? You know what I'm talking about? You ever think about that as a kid running through the aisles of a grocery store, knocking all the groceries over? I was talking to, I think, a friend about that this weekend. I always thought of doing that, and I thought of it this week. That's what, that's what happens when you get angry at someone. They're just walking through the grocery aisles of your soul, knocking over your little idols. Like, wait, I really like that. Control. I remember that chart that Phil put up. Control. A comfort. Happiness. Just knocking them over, right? And so you respond in anger. But now we see clearly, we know that lust doesn't satisfy, but that the, a loving commitment between a spouse reflecting what Jesus' relationship to his church is, is, is sweet and it's satisfying. Or that learning self-control so that as a young person treating people of the opposite sex is a blessing. Because what the world is telling them is just have as many encounters as you can until you figure out what you really like and what's really good for you. But if you'll show them that a brother in the Lord will love them and care for them and treat them with tenderness, see, that's right, it's worth rejecting the ways of the world, my former ignorance, and saying, yes, Lord, I want to be pure. I want to love my brothers and sisters in Christ as you would. Are you wearied by sin, serving your and you don't want to serve your old ways anymore, or are you still serving your old ways? Are you giving your sin some leash in your life? Is there sin that's just running rampant in your life, knocking over all the... Well, I don't want to mix illustrations here. Is there sin that you've given a little room to in your life? It's you're not reigning in by the grace of God and saying, no, I won't be a slave anymore. Are you able to say with the one who is weary of sinning, Lord, give me obedience or take me home? Have you ever prayed that prayer? I have. Lord, give me obedience or just take me home. You must give it to me. And because I'm not home today with the Lord, that means today you're going to give me what I need to be obedient. And he'll do it. He will do it if you will ask him. I wonder if you've ever prayed that way, shared that longing to be done with sin with another child of obedience, part of the same family. Would you, just pray, would you pray for me? I'm fighting this sin in my life. Or would it be strange if someone were to ask you that? Hey, what sins are you wrestling with lately that I can be in prayer for with you over? Yeah, I don't know. I can't really think of anything. That should never come out of our lips. Church, we should say, thank you for asking. Will you pray for me for X, Y, and Z? Are the passions of your former ignorance, the things that you were unaware of, are you still making room for them in your heart? Friend, leave them behind. That's what Peter's telling you. If you have the hope of the gospel, leave them behind. Do not be conformed. Do not be shaped. Do not be molded by them anymore. Do not fit into the mold of the world anymore. Walk away from it. Don't be conformed to your former passions, but put on those things that mark you as a child of obedience. Brothers and sisters, saving hope, it creates a, a spiritual fitness and a sobriety, as Peter talked about, preparing your minds for action, being sober-minded. It creates that in us. This hope fosters this kind of desire for God's glory in our hearts. 
And so who or what is, is hindering your, your spiritual fitness and your spiritual joy by enticing you with the desires of your former, former ignorance? Maybe there's relationships in the world that you have not transitioned to see them as people that need to be reached for the sake of Christ, but you're still keeping them as friends who are really just encouraging wickedness in your heart. You need, to, you need to shift gears in your mind and say, no, 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 they're a part of the mission field. They, they are not my comrades. They are those who are dying in their sin, and I must see them saved. Or are you allowing them to entice you with your former desires? And thirdly, those who have full hope are, are those and who are seeking holiness are those who have a new calling and a new conduct. Verses 15 and 16 say this, As he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct. Excuse me, you also be holy. Yes, in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. I believe that Peter is quoting Leviticus 11 verse 44. And here's how that reads. For I am Yahweh your God, Therefore, set yourselves apart or sanctify yourselves or make yourselves holy. Be holy, for I am holy. And then he says this, and you shall not make for yourselves, you shall not make yourselves unclean with any of the sharets rama haretz, any of the swarming things that move on the earth. Why does God command that? And Peter doesn't pick it up. The reason for some of these Commands that we might read in the Old Testament, in Leviticus, you go, why, why can't they eat creepy crawly things? What's wrong with that? They have lots of legs that crawl on the ground. Phil will actually probably get into more of that later, so we'll leave, leave that up to him uh, to, to exposit all of those commands. But here's the point. When you read those commands in Leviticus and in Exodus, it's not to make you go, oh, yes, yeah, should I eat a centipede or not? Tasty or yucky. It's to make you say, whatever God says, I will do. God was giving them distinct ways to live that would separate them from the nations, the pagan nations of the world. You will not do these things, and you will do these things. And the reason is because you're my people. And when the nations look in and see, see you obeying my commands, they will say, those people are children of obedience. They have been called out of their old passions, their old ways as the text says, as he who called you out is holy, so you also must be holy in all of your conduct. Your calling is it's your identity, isn't it? And identity is everything in our world today. What, you, what do you identify as? Or your job, it easily becomes your identity, your occupation, the way that you school your children. It can easily become your identity, how much money you have, the, the shape that your 401k is in. We latch on to those things, how people view us in the workplace. I get that. It's easy to, to make those things our identity. But the problem is that if our identity is not in the way that Peter describes it here, that we are called and we are, we are to be holy, in all of our conduct as children of obedience, that identity cannot fulfill. It falls short. It devalues who you are as a person created in the image of God whose value is not primarily in your occupation or in your finances or in what kind of house you have, what kind of car you drive. No, you have been called to be holy. That is to be different. That is to be set apart. That is to be distinct. And that's what holiness means. Joel Beakey summarizes God's holiness this way. Listen to it. Now, this is a, this is a longer quote than I might, we might typically read, but I think this is really helpful. The holiness of God points to two specific elements of God's character. First, it points to the fact that God is fully set apart and different from anything and anything else. Second, it points to the fact that he is morally righteous in his manifold perfections. 
And so being holy in the first place then means that God is altogether different and set apart in glory and power, wisdom, righteousness, authority, goodness, love, truth, and grace, and knowledge. But holiness also refers to, the, to, to God's perfect righteous character. And so not only is God holy, but he calls us to holiness. Not only is he perfect and righteous in his character by his very essence, but through the work of the cross, we too are called to be holy. We are called out of our sin and away from our old ways of living, our old conduct to live lives that are distinct and and have a different flavor and that are a delight to the Lord. And so what Peter does here is he doesn't reinterpret or change the meaning of this Old Testament command made to Israel. No, he draws literal application of a timeless theological point. One author says he calls his readers to holiness by appealing to God's holiness. And so, because God is holy, so we must pursue holiness. Holiness, that is lives that are characterized by love for his word, by desire to be pure, to be people of integrity. We want to be faithful to obey God's commands out of love for him. Holiness is not boringness. It is true joy and delight. Obedience to God in all aspects of life is the proper response to the wonders of His sovereign mercies in Christ. And so, in application here, oh, there's, there's so much application as we think about this text, but one day Israel will seek holiness again just as that command was made to them to be holy and they weren't. There's a great hope here because God is faithful to all of his promises. God is going to restore Israel. In fact, Isaiah tells us that they will be called the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord in chapter 62. And so when Jesus comes again to to set up his kingdom, his people, his redeemed, a remnant will be restored and they will fulfill this command in a way that they're not doing now. And there is great hope for us in that. Because all of God's commands, he provides the resources for through his grace. And for us today, Christ has provided all that we need to fulfill these commands And so you must, by God's grace, if you have this hope in you, you can be distinct and set apart and reserved for the Lord. So is that your desire? Is that your desire, brothers and sisters? To be pure, to be holy, to be godly, to see sin triumphed over in your life to love the church, pure love, without hypocrisy, without deceit, without envy or rivalry. As Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your bodies, saints. Old Country Baptist Church, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. May that be our prayer. May we be, by God's grace, set apart and distinct. Not so that we can be puffed up. Not so that we can say, oh yeah, Gold Country Baptist Church, they're really the godly ones. But because we've been saved by grace, apart from our works, through faith, which is a gift, by Christ alone, who is the Savior of all men, to the glory of God alone, who alone deserves honor and praise. For his work in us. So as these saints struggled in the ways that we do, these ancient saints, just one final point of application. Church, if we're tempted to get the world to like us, if we want to be holy and distinct, we can't long for the world to like us and to love us. 
In fact, if we're going to live holy lives, the world is going to reject us. But you see, that's exactly the point. That's exactly what we're called to do. That is the mission. Later in chapter 3, Peter says that they're surprised when you don't go about drinking and living in immorality and sensuality like you used to. Churches, the world's surprised that we're not living like that. Or would they say, oh, you're a Christian? I, had, I would have had no idea. Or, or is there a distinctness to us, kind of an otherworldliness about us where they go, man, there's something distinct and unique about those people from GCBC. They love God's word and they love Christ and their lives are different. And not only that, but that we've told them about it because we want to be faithful to preach the gospel. Church, may they not be surprised by the way that we live because we're so committed to Christ that our lives are distinct. And they go, yeah, I I know you're a Christian and you've told me about what that looks like and you're living it out before me. May we see this new nature at work in us in a way that pleases the Lord and brings Him glory. Would you pray with me that God would do this in us? Let's pray together. Lord, we've been exhorted as children of obedience to not be conformed to the world, to our former lusts, which, which, are, which, are which are ours, which were ours in our former ignorance, but like you, O oh God, who's called us to be holy, would you help us to be holy? Would you help us to be honest and transparent about our sins, honest and transparent about the passions that, that are clinging on to us, that we are tempted by to, to hold on to? Lord, would you help us to be marked by holiness and that we might not take your name in vain? Lord, you tell us to come and to drink of living waters. Not only that, but to to drink your blood and to eat your flesh. That is to come to you and take all of who you are, to be identified with you and to be controlled and, and led by you. And we want to be, O oh Lord. So help us, we pray. Help us to love that we're children of obedience for your glory. Intensify our gratitude, Lord, we pray. And fill us with hope and holiness in order that the infinite value of Christ might be put on display in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.